Hi, today we're going to talk about a few basic concepts in instrumental analysis. My goal here is to give you a big picture overview so that when we get around to talking about specific instruments, you can more easily understand what I'm talking about. In general, there are two types of chemical analysis, qualitative and quantitative. Returning to the food analogy that I used in the previous video, you might consider that qualitative analysis is like figuring out what the ingredients are in a particular recipe, while quantitative analysis is determining how much of each ingredient you need to use. Qualitative analysis can give you an analysis of what elements are present, or it can tell you what molecules those elements are combined into, or both. Now, if I'm telling you about a particular method of analysis, you might ask me, is this a qualitative method or a quantitative method? And the answer is probably going to be yes. That is, most methods that tell you what elements or molecules are present are also able to tell you how much of them are present. In this video, I'm going to talk primarily about the process of quantitative analysis. But before I get into more detail, we need to learn some vocabulary. An analyte is the specific chemical species that you are trying to measure. Some analytical methods allow you to measure multiple analytes at once, but you can't really choose a method until you know specifically what analyte or analytes you're looking for. A sample is the actual thing that you run through your instrument. If you're lucky, your sample will contain your analyte, but it will also probably contain other things. Your solvent, for one. So if you're trying to measure lead in tap water, your analyte is lead. Your sample may or may not have any lead in it, but it will definitely have water. It might also have dissolved species like chlorine, sodium, and calcium. A signal is the electrical response that you receive from your instrument as it measures your analyte. Now, signals are complicated things. We're going to talk a lot about signals and noise next week, but for now, know that any instrument that runs on electricity is going to give you some sort of readout in response to an electrical signal. Let's stop and talk briefly about method detection limits, often abbreviated as MDL. Again, we're going to talk more about these through the course of the class, but for now you should know that MDLs are the smallest concentration of analyte that can be quantified. There's always a theoretical method detection limit. For example, if your method produces photons, you can't have half a photon, so one molecule in your entire sample would give you your theoretical MDL but the actual MDL is usually due to instrument noise, which again, we're going to talk about next time. One of the first things that you will measure on your instrument is what we call a blank, which is a sample that is used to establish a baseline reading, namely what we expect a reading to look like when no analyte is present. Now there are several types of blanks. The first is a matrix blank, which contains everything in your sample except your analyte. Unfortunately, matrix blanks are usually very hard to create because you rarely know everything that's in your sample. The easiest sort of blank to create is a solvent blank, which is just a solvent. For natural water samples, your solvent blank would be DI water. Finally, if your method involves adding chemicals to your sample in order to take a measurement, you can create a reagent blank, which is your solvent, plus any reagents that you would add to a sample. Now let's talk about standards. A standard contains a known amount of your analyte. Often these are in solution, so we usually are going to be talking about concentrations of analytes in a standard. There are two types of standards, external standards and internal standards. External standards are made up separately from your sample and also analyzed separately from your sample. External standards are always just solutions of one or more analytes that you want to look at. Internal standards are added directly to your sample and therefore are analyzed at the same time as your sample. Internal standards may contain your analyte or they may contain something that is similar to your analyte. So now we're going to talk about how we use external standards to quantify analytes. And then after that, we're going to talk about using internal standards to do the same thing. When we use external standards for quantitation, we create what we call a calibration curve. This is a series of external standards with known concentration. By graphing the instrument response to each external standard, you can develop a mathematical relationship between response and concentration. When creating a calibration curve, you always want to choose a range of concentrations that bracket your sample concentration. In other words, you need to have at least one standard below the concentration of your sample and at least one standard above the concentration of your sample. 
Now, of course, you have no idea what the actual concentration of your sample is. That's why you're measuring it. So you have to guess at a range in which the concentration will fall and make your calibration curve cover that range. So how many standards should you have in a calibration curve? First of all, you always need to have a minimum of three. But the more important thing is to look at the range of concentrations that you are covering. For each order of magnitude, that is factors of 10, in your range, you must have three standards. As long as that is true, you can have any number of standards. In general, the upper limit is determined by your willingness to actually make those standards in lab. So when you make a calibration curve, you're basically going to create your standards and run them on the instrument. You're going to graph the concentrations of the standards on the x-axis and the instrument responses on the y-axis, and then you do a linear fit. You want to make sure that you have both the equation for the line and the r squared for your linear fit. You're going to use the equation for the line to calculate the concentrations of your samples, and the r squared is a measure of quality for your external standards. The closer your r squared is to 1, the more linear your calibration curve is and the more trustworthy your measurements are going to be. But sometimes you will notice that one or more of your points falls very far off the line. In many cases, what this means is you messed up when you were diluting your standards. But sometimes you have to be careful if the point that is off the line is the most concentrated standard, what we call the high standard. So let's look at an example. You can see in this graph that most of the points fall on the straight line, but the high standard seems a bit low. Now imagine that your research advisor looks at this graph and tells you to remake your standards just in case you mess them up. So you do that, you get the exact same graph. So your advisor is very frustrated and tells you to make 100 different standards all at different concentrations. After a very long day in lab, you finally made all the standards, you run them on the instrument, and you got this graph. What you have discovered is the limit of linearity for your instrument, which is basically the point at which you stop getting a linear instrument response. The most common reason this happens is that you have maxed out the detector. In other words, your detector cannot register any more electrical signal. However, if you need to add a reagent, like a colorimetric agent, to make your method work, this could be a limitation of your reagent. For example, one colorimetric agent I use in my GenCam labs starts to precipitate once it gets above a certain concentration. One of the things we can determine from looking at a calibration curve is what we call the sensitivity of an instrument. In general, the sensitivity of an instrument is its ability to measure very small differences in concentrations. And the larger the slope of the calibration curve, the more sensitive your instrument is. For example, you can look at these two calibration curves, which were made using the same concentrations, and notice that the difference between trying to measure 88 ppm and 90 ppm would be much more difficult to measure using the blue calibration curve and much easier to measure with a red curve. All right, now we're going to talk about how to use internal standards to quantify an analyte. We do this using a process called standard addition. Basically, before you analyze your sample, you add a known amount of analyte to the sample. We often call this process spiking. We then measure both an unaltered aliquot of sample and an aliquot of sample that has been spiked with analyte. So let's look at an example. So here we have just run an unaltered sample and we have graphed its response. Because we did not add any analyte to this, we put it at zero on the x-axis. We then take a sample and add 100 parts per million of analyte to it. And we add the instrument response to that spiked sample to our graph. Now I'm going to do this twice, once with a sample with 200 parts per million added and once with a sample with 400 parts per million added. And then I'm going to run a linear fit. So this linear fit is going to give us our instrument sensitivity. But it still doesn't exactly tell us what the concentration of our sample is. One way to do that is to extend the line past the y-axis and find the x-intercept, because the x-intercept is basically going to tell us what the concentration of a blank would probably be. And the difference between the x-intercept and the y-axis is going to tell us what the concentration of our sample is. So in this case, our x-intercept is around minus 125, so our sample concentration is going to be about 125. Now the process of standard addition is a little harder than using a calibration curve, especially if you have a lot of samples. So why would anyone do it? 
basically, we use this in situations where we expect to see matrix effects. This is basically where you have something in your sample, which is not your analyte, but nonetheless affects the signal received by your detector. So the substances that we find within our sample are things we call interferences. And interferences can fall into two categories. Some are going to be chemicals that respond to the probe the same way our analyte does, and others are chemicals that keep your analyte from responding in the way that you expect. And I'm going to have a lot to say about interferences and matrix effects in the future. So this has been a very brief overview, but I hope it has been enough to show you that quantifying the amount of an analyte in a sample might be straightforward, but there's also a good chance it might be tricky. I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.